In Ecclesiastes 3, Solomon says, there's a time for every event under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. When it comes time to die, most people don't ask for a crowd to watch them die. Most of the time, it's a private event with close family and loved ones. Even when a person is sentenced to death while in prison, the gallery of witnesses is small. I think it's nearly impossible for us this morning to grasp what the crucifixion of Jesus was like. It was anything but private. (laughs) It was a public display put on by Rome to make sure everyone knew who was in charge. Crucifixion was usually reserved for those who committed the worst of crimes, especially insurrection. The Romans made a spectacle of the agony and humiliation. If you were with us last Sunday, we saw that Jesus was declared not guilty three times by the Roman governor Pilate. We saw the dishonest Jewish religious leaders do their best to manipulate the justice system to secure the death of Jesus. Neither Pilate nor the Jewish religious leaders cared about true justice. They cared about getting what they wanted, which ultimately led to Pilate sentencing Jesus to death. Now, as we walk through this passage this morning, I want us to, to wrestle with this question. What is John specifically wanting us to grasp through what he emphasizes in this gospel account of the death of Jesus Christ? I'm I'm gonna say that again. What is it that John is specifically wanting us to grasp through what he emphasizes in this gospel account of the death of Jesus Christ? Turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 19. Verse 17, they took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. Pilate Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on, on the cross. It was written, Jesus, the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Now, it's important for us to understand that by the time verse 17 had occurred, Jesus had already been whipped mercilessly, His flesh was mutilated, his bones exposed, and possibly even his internal organs. The date is most likely April 3rd, A.D. 33. Each criminal, as part of their punishment, had to carry their cross on their back to the place of crucifixion. This would have been the horizontal beam of the cross And Jesus, we know this by the account of the other Gospels, Jesus carried the cross at least as far as the city gate, when at that point he was too weak to carry it any further, and Simon of Cyrene was asked to carry it the rest of the way. They went to a place called Golgotha, meaning a place of a skull. It was probably called this because the stony barren hill looked like a skull. A sign would have hung around Jesus' neck even as he was carrying the cross, most likely. And what the, the sign did is it listed the crimes of the victim. Then, when they were nailed to the cross, those crimes were, were nailed above their head. The text tells us that Jesus was crucified in the middle and there were two men on either side. Remember, we mentioned this last week, that it's very likely that Jesus was crucified on the cross that was meant for Barabbas. Crucifixion was so brutal 
that no Roman citizen could be crucified without the permission of the emperor. Think about that. The victim was stripped naked and either nailed or tied to the cross. Victims may hang in the hot sun for hours and even days before dying. D.A. Carson's explanation is, of crucifixion is this. Crucifixion was unspeakable, uh, unspeakably painful and degrading. Whether tied or nailed to the cross, the victim endured countless convulsions as he pulled with his arms and pushed with his legs to keep his chest cavity open for breathing and then collapsed in exhaustion until the demand for oxygen demanded renewed convulsions. The scourging, the loss of blood, the shock from the pain all produced agony that could go on for days, ending at least by suff suffocation, at last by suffocation, cardiac arrest, or loss of blood. When there was reason to hasten death, the execution squad would smash the victim's legs. Death followed almost immediately, either from shock or from collapse that cut off breathing. Now please remember today <laughs> that in the midst of this brutality that Jesus is a willing victim. <laughs> he had help but willingly suffered and willingly went to the cross. Willingly. He had in his power and authority to stop a whole thing. <laughs> but he was here, what has John been saying? To do the will of his Father. Now, I want to just show you a few slides. We're going to go through these somewhat quickly, but this, these will give you a picture somewhat of, of what it was very just likely like back then and what the cross even looked like and how the sign was hung on the cross. You can go ahead and go to the next one. You can see where the nails would have been nailed through his wrists. Go ahead and go to the next one. The nails in his feet. How he would have hung. Now many of you have, have seen on the cross, you, you've seen there's, there's a little ledge there a lot of times for either their feet or some place to rest their back on. You, you need to understand that that was not put there by the Romans to ease their pain. It was there to prolong their pain. Remember, the goal of the Romans was to produce uh, an illustration for everybody that said, don't mess with us. Pilate was the one who had the sign created that Jesus likely wore, and this hung above him on the cross, and it said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. It was, it was written, the text says, in Hebrew or Aramaic, which was a language in common use in Judea. It was also written in Latin, which is the official language of the army. And it was also written in Greek, which was the common language used throughout the Roman Empire. Now, this is incredibly significant because it signifies that Jesus was crucified in a place where there were people from all over. There were thousands of visitors in Jerusalem because of Passover, so Jesus hung there for all to see. And Pilate here wrote, Jesus, the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Why did he write that? To tick the Jews off. He was saying to the Jews, this is your king. The king that is looking like this, that is hanging on the cross, this is your king. And they were furious at it. Don't write this, write rather saying, I am the king of the Jews. That is what Jesus did. They did not like what was written there. Pilate wants to humiliate them because they in some ways had humiliated him, if you'll remember last week, by saying that if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar's. Pilate didn't like that. Now, one of the key things John wants us to see in his account of the crucifixion 
is that the sovereign plan of God is being fulfilled. Okay. In his effort to stick it to the Jewish religious leaders, Pilate is accomplishing God's purposes. Indeed, Jesus is the king of the Jews, and even more so, the cross is the means of what? His exaltation and glorification. The fact that John highlights Pilate's writings and writing this in three different languages is announcing the worldwide impact of the cross of Jesus Christ. After all, Jesus died for the sins of the world. And John wants us to understand this, understand that there's a bigger thing going on here. Pilate is proclaiming Jesus is a king. Indeed, he is the king. And his kingship is over the whole world. He is the king of kings, actually. It is he, it is he who hung on the cross that will turn this instrument of execution into an instrument of glorification. It is it is he who turned an instrument into, of, of brutality into a symbol of salvation worn by millions even up to this day. No one back then would have worn a cross around their neck. No one would have had a cross on their bracelet or on their t-shirt. That, that, uh, 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 a similar, that would be like us wearing um, uh, uh, a necklace with an electric chair on it. No one would have done that. So, so, so why do people do that today? Because of what Jesus did. He, he took an instrument of brutality and made it a symbol of salvation and glorification for the world. <laughs> why? How? Because he's a true king. See, John wants you and I to know, to, remember, remember why John write this? I'm writing this so that you might believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing you might have life in his name. God used Pilate to announce the true king to the world, and the Jews want him to change it, but Pilate refuses. Verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now at most crucifixions, a centurion would be assigned with four soldiers to help them. They would nail the person to the cross, and it was custom then for the executioners to divide the garments among themselves, whether it was Jesus or anybody else. Now it's likely that the plural form of the word garments here refers to Jesus's clothes. So it's referring to his belt, his sandals, his head covering, and outer garment. The tunic or undergarment was a seamless piece of clothing from top to bottom. It was, it was seamless, and they cast lots for that. And in so doing, and this is really important, again, remember, this is what John wants us to understand. In so doing, they are fulfilling Scripture. Because Psalm twenty-two, eighteen says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now why? Why would John include all this detail? We're going to see more detail here in a little bit. Why is John including all this detail? John is emphasizing a point throughout this passion account of Jesus Christ that we cannot miss. And that is this. The sovereign plan of God is being fulfilled in the suffering of the Messiah. This was God's redemptive plan from the beginning, even as David detailed centuries earlier, before this means of execution was even implemented. The Father's plan is being fulfilled, and the second part is crucial. The Son is obedient to the Father's plan. Don't miss this this morning. 
John wants to make sure that you and I understand in the midst of the immediate, the sovereign plan of God is being fulfilled and the Son always does the will of the Father. Verse 25, Therefore the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene, When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. Four separate women at the cross. His mother Mary, his mother's sister. By the way, there's a lot of uncertainty as to who his mother's sister was. There's some debate about that. If you want to know more about that, you can write an email to ask Dr. Ekman. (laughs) I will say this. Many people believe that his mother's sister was uh, two respected theologians, D.A. Carson and Warren Wiersbe, believe that his mother's sister is referring to Salome, which is James and John's mom. But just know there's uncertainty around who that actually was. There was Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Now, I just want us for a moment not to miss what John is stressing here. Can you imagine being Mary, the mother of Jesus, at the cross? You know, sometimes we read the Bible and we just read, but we don't stop to actually think about what this was like. We don't put ourselves in the story. I can't fathom being a parent and seeing my child die this way. I've been with parents who've had to say goodbye to their kids in a warm, comfortable environment of a children's hospital, for example. That's hard enough. I've been with parents who suddenly lost their child in a car accident. It's hard. Can you imagine watching your kid hang on the cross? Unrecognizable in many ways. You know, back in Luke 2.35, Simeon told Mary that a sword will pierce your own soul. (laughs) What's fascinating to me is here Jesus is hanging on the cross and he sees the concern on his mother's face and he makes sure mom is taken care of. (laughs) On the cross, Jesus is thinking of others. Think about that for a minute. It's hard for us to fathom the amount of pain this type of death would have taken on. And here Jesus is on the cross in excruciating pain and he's thinking of others. We know from scripture he was thinking of his father, fulfilling his father's plan. He was thinking of his mother. He was thinking of the thief on the cross whom he forgave. He was thinking of those who were crucifying him and who sent him to be crucified because he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And he's thinking of us. Well on the cross, thinking of others. Think about it. When you're suffering, are you thinking of others? John refers here, to, he refers to himself here in, in chapter 19, verse 26, and then we'll see this also next week in chapter 20, verse 2, as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, there are some people who, who think that, that this is John being a little bit prideful. I would say that is, it's the opposite of that. It, this does not mean that the others weren't loved by Jesus. Nor nor does it mean that John somehow sees himself as superior to the others. Remember that when John wrote this gospel, most of his, his brothers in Christ, his fellow disciples, had already died. John was older when he wrote this gospel. He was an older man. 
and he was profoundly aware of his own sin and his own need. And as a result, he, re he reveled in the wonderful grace of God through Jesus Christ that had grabbed a hold of him. Remember, he was once called the son of thunder. He saw himself as an object of God's love. It's, it's really no different than what Paul says in Galatians 2.20 when he says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. This is not a sign of the apostles arrogance, but rather a sign of his humility and brokenness. Jesus loves me. Wow. Verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a, a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Now part of the, the torture of the scourging and crucifixion, the loss of blood combined with the heat was dehydration. That was part of the torture. Now please note what John says in verse 20, 28 here. He said, Jesus knowing that all things had already been accomplished and in order that the scriptures might be fulfilled said, I am thirsty. Let's just remember, no one knew the scriptures like Jesus knew the scriptures. No one knew the divine plan of the Father like Jesus knew the divine plan of the Father. And what Jesus is saying in those words is this, all the steps that the Father had sovereignly ordained to happen prior to his death had been completed, and death was imminent. John doesn't want us to miss this. All the sovereign plans that the Father had ordained to happen prior to his death had happened, and death was now in, imminent. You see, John wants us to know that the Father's sovereign plan of redemption for mankind has been fulfilled, and its fulfillment is a direct result of the obedience of Jesus Christ. Don't miss that second part. The sovereign plan of God was fulfilled because of the obedience of Jesus Christ to his Father's plan. This act right here fulfilled Psalm 69, 21, which says, They also gave me a bitter herb in my food, and for my thirst gave me vinegar to drink. Now, don't confuse this drink with the drink offered to Jesus on the way to the cross in Mark 15, 23, which was actually wine mixed with myrrh. That was actually a sedative designed to dull the pain, which Jesus refused. This right here was actually, it would have prolonged life and prolonged the pain. It was a drink, it was a, a drink oftentimes used by Roman soldiers. We also need to remember that Roman crosses, you know, in some of these movies, you know, Jesus, these crosses are like 15 feet off the ground. Roman crosses were not that high off the ground. It would not have been very hard to, to raise this up to Jesus' mouth. Verse 30, therefore when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. What the drink did do was allow Jesus to get out his final words. It is finished. Now, follow me here. We know from the scriptures that Jesus spoke seven times during the six hours he hung on the cross. Okay, I'm going to give you these seven, but John only mentions three. <laughs> First, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, Luke 23, 34. Second, he said, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise, Luke 23, 43. Third, Woman, behold your son, and then to John, behold your mother. Then there were three hours of darkness when Jesus was silent. Fourth, 
My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Luke 27, 46. Fifth, he said, I am thirsty. John 19, 28. Sixth, it is finished. And seven, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. Now, John only highlights three of the seven. And the last one he records is, it is finished. Now, I'm going to say it again. Why did John write this gospel? John wrote this gospel so that we might believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing, we might have life in his name. So the last words that John records in his gospel that Jesus said on the cross is, to telestai. That's the Greek word, to telestai. Now, the word actually means it is finished. It always will be finished. To complete, it means to bring an activity to a successful finish. When Jesus said this word, he was not proclaiming defeat. It was actually a proclamation of victory. It was a shout of victory. And I want to explain it to you this morning in a little more detail. The word, this Greek word, was a very familiar word used in various arenas during that time. Servants would use this word when reporting to their masters after completing the task. They would say, task done, to tell us die. It's completed. Remember, Jesus said in his prayer to his father in John 17, 4, I have glorified thee on earth, having what? Accomplished, to tell us die, the work that you have given me to do. Priests also use this word when examining the sacrifices the Jewish people would bring to offer on the altar. It was, remember, it was against the, the law, the Jewish law, for people to offer an imperfect sacrifice. So the priests here would ex- inspect these sacrifices to make sure they were perfect. When, when they examined the sacrifices and they realized it was perfect, it was complete, they would say, to tell us, die. It's complete. It's perfect. Remember, Jesus Christ was God's perfect, spotless, faultless sacrifice. Three times we witnessed last week, Pilate said, I find no guilt in this man. Luke 8, 29, the demon said, what do we have to do with you, son of God? His father said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Judas said, Matthew 27, 4, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. There is only one perfect sacrifice for sins. Hear this, friends. There is only one sinless, spotless, faultless sacrifice for your sins and my sins, and his name is Jesus Christ. That is why if you're looking to anyone or anything else to save you other than Christ and Christ himself, you are looking to something or someone that is insufficient to save you from your sins. There's only one. Artists would also use this word. When an artist completed a painting, they would look at it and say, to tell us die, it's finished. If you read the Old Testament apart from Jesus and the, cro- and the cross, the painting is incomplete. When Jesus came, he completed the picture. Remember what happened on the road to Emmaus There were two discouraged, forlorn men walking, and they were joined by a stranger who proceeded to tell tell them all about his death. It was Jesus himself. And and he said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into glory? And beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Jesus completed the picture. Painting finished. To tell us die. Merchants would also use this word. To them, the word meant, you ready? The debt has been fully paid. In fact, the receipt would even have the word to tell us die on it. It is finished. The debt has been paid in full. As sinners, we've talked about this in the last few weeks. Our debt was so great it was impossible for any of us to pay. 
We didn't have enough. It, it would be like financially owing a hundred trillion dollars. You don't have enough time or enough money to pay it off. And Jesus comes along for those who place their faith in him to be their savior, and he says, paid in full. The wages of our sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Is there any wonder why John decided to finish with to tell us die? Because I want you to know, readers, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and if you believe in him, you'll have life in his name. Salvation is a finished work. The message of the gospel is done, not due. We dare not add, add anything to it or take anything away from it. I just want to reiterate, there are not many ways to be saved because there's only one perfect sacrifice for your sins. There is one way to be saved. On the cross, he cried to tell us die. Thank you, Jesus. And John records that with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Now, I just want to go back to, to, to two other passages in John briefly. First one is John 10, 17, and 18, where Jesus says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Then I want to read John 8, 29, and it says, And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. John wants us to make sure that we understand that Jesus obeyed his Father's will all the way to his death. He also wants us to understand in the middle of it all that Jesus was in control the whole time. It says he gave up his spirit. We know from other passages, they didn't even have, Jesus was already dead. They didn't break his legs as they did the soldiers or, or the criminals on either side of him. It was pleasing to the Father to, to, for his son to die on our behalf. And so with that, I just want to ask us our favorite two-word question here at Steadfast, and that is, so what? And, and this is going to be brief here this morning, but... but, but the first, I have two questions for us to wrestle with, and the first one is this. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? I mentioned this on Easter Sunday. The most important question anybody ever answers is, what are you going to do with Jesus? Most important question in, in anybody ever has been born, never ever will be born, is, is what are you going to do with Jesus Christ? Sin has separated you and I from God. Jesus made a way for us to have a relationship with God the Father because He was our perfect sacrifice. And I, 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 we don't talk about this very often, but for those, for those people on earth who, who choose to refuse to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, they have a fate ahead of them that is a lot worse than the cross. As brutal as, as brutal as a crucifixion was, eternal separation from God forever in hell is worse. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ to be your Savior? He's calling you. He loves you. He wants you. The second question is this. Does the fulfillment of the sovereign plan of God and the obedience of His Son all the way to death on the cross lead me to worship? Does the fulfillment of the sovereign plan of God and the obedience of His Son all the way to death on the cross lead me to worship? The sin of the world was placed on Him. Again, we have a hard enough time dealing with our own sin. Can you imagine having the sin of billions and billions of people placed on you? Being forsaken by his father. 
I, I don't know about you, but when I study this, it causes me just, just to ask myself, if, if this is what he has done for me, am I living my life as a life of worship for him? If this is what he's done for me, am I living my life as a life of worship for him? 